Hi strangers! Welcome or welcome back to Strange Nights, the part of my channel where I do little film reviews. I'm Vivian Strange and tonight we're talking about Greta Gerwig's Barbie movie. Or, as it's better known, one half of Hollywood's last multi-bazillion dollar marketing event, Barbenheimer. And if that sounds a bit cynical to you, brace yourself. Also, I refuse to make a big unnecessary show of, this video was made during the WGA SAG after a labor strikes and we don't want to promote strut content, yada yada yada, that a lot of other YouTubers are doing. First, no one gives a shit about non-union YouTubers making videos on current content, and that's probably doubly true for a tiny channel like mine. Second, this is not me promoting Barbie, this is me reviewing Barbie. There's a difference, and it kind of matters. Third, I am actively insisting that you, viewer, do not spend a single dollar to see this film. The torrents are up, and I'm the YouTuber who isn't the least bit shy to encourage her viewers to pirate their media. Do not give studios your money. Fourth, me and my channel will always be on the side of labor unions and labor strikes. Solidarity with the WGA and SAG-AFTRA. Solidarity with all the VFX artists and workers in the video game industry who are also trying to strike. Also, solidarity to the music industry workers who should start striking next. Hey, how are y'all doing? And fuck it, I'm gonna go one step further and insist that all below-the-line crew in the entertainment industry should strike because I believe they are just as entitled to residuals as writers, actors, and directors. Just remember that whenever these current strikes end and the writers and actors get the money that they are entitled to, that a majority of the crew members that create everything you watch are still not getting paid dick shit. Sorry, got a little carried away. I guess I did make a big unnecessary show of it. Whatever. Barbie, 2023. Directed by Greta Gerwig, starring Margot Robbie, Ryan Gosling, and a whole rainbow of token actors to tick all the diversity boxes essential to making this kind of film in the 2020s. White Barbie. I'm like the Barbie you think of when someone says, think of a Barbie. Fat Barbie. I don't want to touch a foot. Tranny Barbie. I like being a helpful decoration. Black Barbie. Tell her how much you love her. Compliment her. Brown Barbie. You are the voice of our generation. <laughs> I know. French Barbie. It's like a spa day for my brain. <laughs> Forever. Dyke Barbie. What's weird will become weirder. And then you look like me. Ah! Oh, I understand. I set myself up for that. Etc. I'll just come out and say it, Barbie is not radical or transgressive in the slightest. It's one of the most baldly and overbearingly liberal Hollywood films I've seen in years. It's almost downright propagandistic. It's like Greta Gerwig saw Hamilton and was like, hold my beer. But that's just it. Anyone expecting this film to be leftist in any sense of the word is setting themselves up for disappointment. Cause, like, it's a movie produced by a goddamn toy company about one of their most profitable products. Seriously, the Barbie movie is a fucking toy commercial, and it's silly to expect much more from it than that. Now, will that stop me from tearing this film a new asshole? Of course not. But here's the thing. I'm an adult, so I can reconcile contradicting sentiments and beliefs within myself. I have no difficulty holding both logic and feeling at the same time, and it does not diminish my powers. Right. It expands them. And the thing is, as critical as I am, I did enjoy this movie in many ways. I compare it to the recent film Nimona, in that the child in me was utterly delighted the whole way through, while the adult in me was painfully aware of how aggressively every single element of the film was carefully designed to pander to me as a queer, trans, autistic zillennial. So, before I wreck Barbie's shit, let me tell y'all everything I truly enjoyed. One, it looks amazing. Seriously, this movie is gorgeous. The backgrounds in Barbie Land are all hand-painted backdrops, the dream houses were actual sets, and my personal favorite touch, when they're traveling between Barbie Land and the real world, these are backdrops being hand-cranked by crew members, old-school Melier style. It's fucking fantastic. Goes to show how awesome movies can look when you use practical effects, physical props, and actual sets instead of green screens and cheap VFX. Revolutionary. Did you bring your roller blades? I literally go nowhere without them. Two. This film is legitimately hilarious. Everyone is having so much fun, and it's obvious. Even though this is a huge studio blockbuster, it's clear that the working environment Greta Gerwig cultivated was a very intimate one, making it feel like just a fun project that she made with her pals. And I always love seeing that. Margot Robbie is fantastic, and I love her, like I do with everything Margot Robbie is in. Also, I wish the film had let her be gayer, like I do with everything Margot Robbie is in. But ultimately, the standout here is Ryan Gosling, and he is sublime! Oh, and now is as good a time as any to mention that Ryan Gosling is one of us. I believe his exact words, on only one of the many occasions he's said something like this, are that he's 47-49% to 49 female. All I'm saying is that on the inside, this Gosling is at least as much goose as Gander. I thought I might stay over tonight. Why? Because we're girlfriend-boyfriend. To do what? I'm actually not sure. But yeah, shit's funny, even beyond the performances. The visual gags are top-notch. Oh, that's cold! Every night is boys' night. I, 
I can't help it. The opening 2001 homage was and still is really fucking funny. And even on rewatches, several jokes made me laugh aloud. Oh, I'm not trained to go over there. I'm trained to stand confidently right here. There's nobody in danger here. And even if there were, I'm not trained to save them. <laughs> I'm not used to that having anything in it. We don't have genitals. Whatever, it's, it's cool. yeah. I have all, all the genitals, yes. I'm ready to be your long-term distance, low-commitment, casual girlfriend, if you'll still have me. You just hold on for one second. Oh, okay. Sublime! I don't know. I'm gonna have to think about that. Even the ones that had me rolling my eyes at the same time. Ooh, are you guys watching The Godfather? The Godfather. I've never seen it. Oh my God, you've never seen The Godfather? This movie is a rich blend of Coppola's aesthetic genius and a triumph to Robert Evans and the architecture of the 70s studio system. I'm not stereotypical Barbie pretty. Note to the filmmakers, Margot Robbie is the wrong person to cast if you want to make this point. There was a lot of eye rolling. I'm a man with no power, does that make me a woman? She thinks I'm a fascist? I don't control the railways or the flow of commerce? Nothing any of our collective imaginations could ever dream of. A podcast hosted by two wise trees, or a choir of 2,000 young fathers. But there's also a shitload of horseboy humor, and I'm always a slut for horses and the boys who ride them. It's one of the queerest and most beautiful hyperfixations a guy can have. At first I thought the real world was run by men. And then there was a minute where I thought it was run by horses. But then I realized that horses are just men extenders. Three, my favorite scene in the film, one that sincerely emotionally touched me. It's just a small moment when Barbie is having an existential epiphany and has this beautiful brief interaction with this old lady. You're so beautiful. I know it. I figured this was a cameo of some sort, like the relative of one of the original Barbie creators or some shit, but it was even cooler than that. That is Anne Roth, one of the best and most acclaimed costume designers of all time. She's been Oscar nommed five times for best costume design, winning twice for The English Patient in 1997 and Ma Rainey's Black Bottom in 2021. Also, here's a heavily abbreviated list of just a few of over 100 films she's designed for since she started working in the 60s. We have Midnight Cowboy, Angels in America, The Birdcage, Places in the Heart, The Talented Mr. Ripley, The Hours, Marathon Man, Clute, Extremely Loud and Incredibly Close, Signs, The Village, Coming Home, The Stepford Wives, Dressed to Kill, Blowout, Mamma Mia, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, Cold Mountain, Working Girl, Doubt, Mildred Pierce, White Noise, and so many goddamn more. And the best part? Greta Gerwig actually had to fight for this scene not to get cut by studio executives. I love that scene so much, and the older woman on the bench is the costume designer Anne Roth. She's a legend. It's a cul-de-sac of a moment, in a way. It doesn't lead anywhere. And in early cuts looking at the movie, it was suggested, well, you could cut it, and actually the story would move on just the same. And I said, if I cut this scene, I don't know what this movie is about. You're so beautiful. I know it. That's fucking inspired. Makes me appreciate Greta Gerwig as an artist a lot more. Okay, that's the stuff I liked. Now, kid gloves coming off. Do you guys ever think about dying? So overall, I think this is actually a really great text to use to teach young children about contemporary feminism. No, that's not a compliment. Plastic or fantastic. Yeah, it's all plastic. Through and through. Barbie is textbook neoliberal white girl boss bullshit. It's admittedly fun, pretty bullshit, but still. See, the fundamental problems with this film come down to what Dyke Barbie says to White Barbie regarding the weird relationship between Barbie Land and the real world. Weird, I know. Best if you don't think about it too much. Sorry, Dyke Barbie, but here on this channel, when someone tells us to Don't ever think it. Oh. We tell them to go fuck themselves and analyze the shit out of it. And Barbie is not immune. And that's the thing. If you take literally any aspect of Barbie and think about it, like, at all, it all falls to pieces and becomes a really terrifying and horribly out of touch portrayal of reality. This movie and every concept driving it is downright dystopian. Now, I'm not getting all cinema sins on this film. I understand. It's a fucking kids movie. Or at least a movie for emotionally stunted zillennial adults. This is not an issue of storytelling logic or suspending disbelief. The reason I'm choosing to zero in on this film's weird flaws and inconsistencies and oft mentioned but never answered questions is because every single step of the way, the text itself calls attention to things that don't make sense and in the same breath waves it away like, just roll with it. Don't ever think it. And that pattern ultimately makes up the foundation of what is a very, very political text that is directly attempting to comment on real world issues 
issues like feminism, consumerism, patriarchy, democracy, and such and such. Well, guess what, Barbie? You want to get real? Let's get real then. Oh, damn. One fucking time they don't crack. Fuck. So, what'll it be then? So if I were to ask you who the villain of this film is, or at least who the text itself frames as the villain, it's pretty clearly patriarchy, right? We just took patriarchy and, you know, made a patriarchy. Yeah. Barbie Land is practically perfect until Ken learns about patriarchy and somehow institutes it in Barbie Land. We just explained to them the immaculate, impeccable, seamless garment of logic that is patriarchy and they crumbled. Well, thankfully, when he was in the real world, Ken didn't get all the way to W in the encyclopedia, so he didn't get a chance to learn about war. Yeah, that's a fifth element joke. The thing about patriarchy as it's represented in the film is that, well... Barbie isn't really interested in unpacking what patriarchy actually is. Ken's understanding of patriarchy is that of a child's. To be honest, when I found out that patriarchy wasn't about horses, I lost interest anyway. Yeah, it's adorable, and it's very clearly a textual attempt to illustrate how absurd the notion of patriarchy, or male supremacy, is. You failed me! Something I do appreciate about this film is how it treats Ken's identity crisis and feelings of inadequacy as valid and sincere, while at the same time effectively demonstrating the foolishness and farce of his superficial veneer of toxic masculinity. This shall henceforth be known as Ken's Mojo Dojo Casa House. I completely disagree with the right-wingers calling this movie anti-man. On the contrary, I find its treatment of the Kens and their psychological existential distress to be very sympathetic and understanding. Because the fact is, the average man does suffer under patriarchy. And that's valid. But it's Barbie and Ken. There is no just Ken. I know plenty of men who are struggling with themselves because of the way capitalist patriarchy has forced them to define themselves in terms of their relationship to women and femininity. Maybe it's time to begin to discover who Ken is. Specifically their dominance and subjugation over them. No, this isn't the answer. <laughs> Honestly, I think this movie is a lot more charitable and pro-man than it's given credit for, at least on the level of individual men and the existential despair of their condition. It offers its male viewers an actually kind of helpful suggestion that you, whatever guy is watching this and identifies with Ken's struggles, you are Kenuff on your own. You're not your girlfriend. You're not your house. You're not your mink. You don't need to have a woman to be happy. You don't need to measure up to the largely toxic notions of what your taught masculinity entails. You are your own person. You are Knuff, and I think that's legitimately sweet. It was hard running stuff. I didn't love it. <laughs> but that's the thing though. The gender problems in our society cannot be boiled down to a matter of individuals. What Ken brings to Barbie Land is not actually patriarchy. Patriarchy is a system, not a pattern of annoying and aggressive behaviors between individual men and women. But Barbie does exactly this. Everything exists to expand and elevate the presence of men. That's amazing. It's beautiful. I know. Granted, again, yes, it is essentially a kids movie. But by its own admission, it's attempting to actually sincerely comment on patriarchy, which makes this liberal reduction particularly troublesome. No, I won't let you do just one appendectomy. But I'm a man. But not a doctor. Can I talk to a doctor? You are talking to a doctor. Can you get me a coffee? No. And I need a clicky pen? No. And a white coat? No. And a sharp thing? No. Yeah, in the real world, Ken cannot perform surgery just by virtue of being a man. But if he were to stay in the real world and live as a human, and were to pursue the career path of a doctor or lawyer or business vermin, the fact of patriarchy is that he would have a gendered advantage over women who are pursuing that same career path. He'd be more likely to get accepted to medical school or lawyer school or business school than Barbie would, on account of him being a man. You guys are clearly not doing patriarchy very well. We're doing it well. Yeah, we just... Uh, hide it better now. Oh. Another example of how patriarchy actually works. Multiple times, Ken tries to get Barbie to be his romantic partner, despite her telling him numerous times that that's not what she wants. To his credit, Ken ultimately respects her wishes and boundaries, and he handles being friend zone better than a lot of guys I've known. And it is kind of refreshing that we never have to watch Ken actually coerce or violate Barbie. That's, that's nice. But the reality of patriarchy is that if it were actually implemented in Barbie land as it is in the real world, Ken could coerce and violate her, and likely get away with it. That's what rape culture is, and it's inseparable from patriarchy. It's rather convenient that the Kens were able to successfully brainwash the Barbies into willingly accepting this new order. What is wrong with them? We just explained to them the immaculate, impeccable, seamless garment of logic that is patriarchy, and they crumble. Cuz... What if they had put up any kind of resistance? Well, what happens in the real world to women who resist the patriarchal powers that be? 
no, the villain of Barbie is not Ken. It's not patriarchy. The true villain of this story is the party that winds up getting everything they want. The ones who ultimately win at the end of the day. Yeah, that's going to make money. Oh! Okay, again, overall, I really did enjoy watching this movie, even when it made me roll my eyes. But... Every time the story shifted to the Mattel executives, my good faith and inner child completely checked out, and I became a being of pure contempt and disgust. But thanks to the Barbies, I too can now relieve myself of this heavy existential burden while holding on to the very real title of CEO. Another thing Dyke Barbie just casually says to hand wave away the ridiculousness of the premise and the nebulous nature of the relationship between Barbie Land and the real world is... Don't blame me, blame Mattel, they make the rules. Does what happens in Barbie Land influence the real world? Boss, these Mojo Dojo Casa houses are literally flying off the shelves. The kids are clamoring for them. All the brothers have started auditions for the Ken movie, which is already a blockbuster hit. <laughs> Or do the happenings in the real world influence what happens in Barbie Land? The girl who's playing with you, she must be sad, and her thoughts and feelings and humanness are interfering with your dullness. The film kind of tries to have it both ways. But if you ask me, you had something to do with this too. Me? It takes two to rip a portal. I don't blame my mom. Maybe you wished us. Maybe it's your fault, Barbie. But the details of that really don't matter. Because whatever the case may be, at the end of the day, Mattel is running this show. I mean, on a metatextual level, of course, given that they, well, they produce the fucking movie. But even inside of the text, Mattel is in the driver's seat. Gloria, Barbie's real life, um, mistress, player, puppeteer, the person directly and indirectly controlling and influencing her life without her knowledge or consent. Not sure what the right word is. You have to find the girl who's playing with you. Playing with me. We're all being played with, babe. But this woman is a representative of the corporation Mattel. Sure, she's the mother of a daughter whom she has difficulty connecting with, hashtag relatable, and she is negatively impacted by living under patriarchy. And this is how the text insists we relate to her as. And it is very emotionally compelling. Greta Gerwig is like the creative queen of millennials with mommy issues. But fuck sentimentality. Let's look closer. Because in addition to being a relatable millennial and beleaguered mother, she is also an asset of the corporation responsible for upholding the system that makes her life so difficult. This whole thing starts because she starts drawing fucking product mock-ups, which of course winds up working out for her bosses. That's a terrible idea. Yeah, that's going to make money. Oh, Ordinary Barbie, I love it. Yes, she's vulnerable and flawed and relatable and subjected to mistreatment by her male bosses, but that doesn't mean Gloria isn't a modern girl boss character archetype. She does indeed have it all. Loving family, beautiful smart daughter, sweet well-meaning husband, and a well-paying job at a seven and a half billion dollar corporation. Bottom line, the human character the text frames as the fucking savior of Barbie land. Hell yes, white savior Barbie. No, it was your mom. Your mom did the saving. Is a part of the problem. And speaking of bottom lines, Shame on you, executive number two. You think I spent my entire life in boardrooms because of a bottom line? No, I got into this business because of little girls and their dreams. Fuck everything about how Mattel is portrayed in this film. But what do we really sell? I'll tell you what, we sell dreams and imagination and sparkle. First of all, can we please, please, please stop humanizing corporations, especially when it's as a bunch of stupid goofballs like Will Ferrell? And when you think of Sparkle, what do you think of after that? Female agency. His comment about not caring about bottom lines in favor of little girls' dreams made me mad. You think I spent my entire life in boardrooms because of a bottom line? No, I got into this business because of little girls and their dreams in the least creepy way possible. Because A... Bullshit, fuckface. If you as an individual really cared about improving the lives of little girls, there are about a million things you would have become instead of a fucking corporate executive. B, when it comes to corporations and the people in positions of power within them, individual motivations don't matter. Not that this character is actually framed as a human being, he doesn't even have a fucking name, he's just the Mattel CEO, but even if we granted him that, his desire to inspire children to follow their dreams means nothing next to the fundamental truth about all corporations and capitalism as a whole. The only thing a corporation cares about is profit. That is what they are built for. That is, by definition and design, the reason for their existence. I'm sorry, but if you are a person living under capitalism today, and if you're watching this, you are, and you believe that there is a single corporation on the face of this planet that actually cares about you as a human being and not solely as a tool to generate them more profit, you are dangerously naive, and honestly kind of foolish. And this isn't just any kind of corporation, this is a toy company. And when we really get down to it, any industry whose primary market is children are seriously some of the most evil fucking corporations there are. 
So a woman does work here. Oh, sweetie, we do more than work here. But the most insidious aspect of the Mattel Corporation's portrayal in Barbie is this bitch. White Barbie's dash through the cubicled corporate labyrinth of the Mattel building brings her to what is presented as a weird, abstract, liminal space where she is given comforting words by an old lady revealed later to be Ruth Handler, the woman who invented Barbie in 1959. So you're Ruth Handler, inventor of Barbie. <gasps> While the male executives of Mattel are very clearly buffoonish caricatures meant as tongue-in-cheek commentaries on the male-dominated corporate world, the portrayal of Ruth Handler is 100% sincere. <gasps> We learn in the end what her homey little kitchen actually is. Her ghost keeps an office on the 17th floor. Which makes this line even more of... I always find I think best at kitchen tables. <laughs> a choice? Nobody looks like Barbie. Except, of course, Barbie. I don't really feel like Barbie anymore. White Barbie has her ultimate come-to-Jesus moment with Ruth, who gives her blessing for Barbie to be a real person and makes her flesh and blood by, like, breathing on her also causing her to suddenly have a vagina as well, but we'll get to that in a bit. But when she's formally introduced, well... You're Ruth from Mattel. Baby, I am Mattel. As I said, we need to stop portraying corporations as human beings. They are not. Oh, you might say, but she's not like Will Ferrell and these dopey executives. Ruth Handler was a real person. She really brought Barbie to the world. She is, objectively speaking, Barbie's creator. But even if you're simplifying things for a kid's movie, if you want to bring in the real to resolve everything and tie up all the story's loose conceptual threads, then you need to get fucking real. Oh, sweetie, we do more than work here. When Ruth says she is Mattel, what she means is that she was one of the co-founders of the company and was its first president from 1945 to 1975. Hashtag girl boss. Oh, and remember her multiple cute little jokes about tax evasion? Baby, I am Mattel. Until the IRS got to me, but that's another movie. It's hilarious, isn't it? A sweet old lady in trouble with the IRS? <laughs> I'm a five foot nothing grandma with a double mastectomy and tax evasion issues. <laughs> Look, I hate capitalism and I hate the US government. And for the average American, I don't consider tax evasion to be morally condemnable on principle. But if we're talking about the CEO of a wealthy corporation evading taxes, yeah, that's a whole other thing. And guess what? Even tax evasion is a mischaracterization of Ruth Handler's actual crimes. See, it wasn't the IRS she got in trouble with. That was for the sake of the joke in the movie, because everyone knows about and hates the IRS. But she was actually in trouble with the SEC, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, the agency meant to prevent market manipulation and corruption. Not quite the IRS, definitely not as familiar to the average moviegoer, and harder to cast as a villain. She was investigated for years before her 1975 resignation for producing fraudulent financial reports, and was charged in 1978 with fraud and false reporting to the SEC. And the cherry on top. She pleaded no contest and blamed her fucking breast cancer for making her unfocused on her business. Hashtag girl boss indeed. Basically, I take issue with the Barbie movie attempting to resolve its real-world existential issues by using its female founder as a shield. Seriously, the big revelatory bombshell is that, oh, everything's okay because Barbie was invented by a woman, actually. Mattel's cool because their first CEO was a woman. We are a company literally made of women. We had a woman CEO in the 90s. And there was another one at some other time. And let's not forget the emotional manipulation of motherhood at play here. Don't you control me? I can't control you any more than I could control my own daughter. I named you after her, Barbara. And I always hoped for you like I hoped for her. Fun fact, she did name the original Barbie after her daughter, Barbara Handler. And two years later, when the company made a boyfriend for Barbie, they named him Ken after their other kid, Barbara's brother, Kenneth Handler. So as far as their namesakes go, Barbie and Ken are more like siblings. You're welcome. <laughs> also, the real-life Ken Handler was gay and eventually became a film director with that whole casting couch reputation, real Brian Singer type, more you know. And really, this should all be expected. But the whole corporations are really just human beings deep down thing is especially bitter when our tour of Barbie Land in the beginning features this. Money is not speech, and corporations have no free speech rights to begin with. So any claim on their part to be exercising a right is just their attempt to turn our democracy into a plutocracy. Oh, and speaking of pre kendom land, Barbie land, can we talk a little more about patriarchy and how this movie doesn't fucking understand it in the slightest? Can we talk about Black Barbie president? No comment! Ah! Black Barbie president! Black Barbie no, seriously, president. no comment. And most importantly, can we please talk about Barbie Land's motherfucking constitution? 
You know what I think? I think we should put our frickin' Constitution back. <sighs> like all neoliberal Hollywood films, Barbie falls to pieces in its third act. Or, more charitably, this part of the story is only compelling to a viewer with the media literacy level of a child. Tell me, what are the stakes here? What's the actual problem at this point in the story? White Barbie comes back to Barbie Land to find that all of her friends have resigned from their positions of power to join the working class. French Barbie and Tranny Barbie have quit being a physicist and a doctor to work as maids. Fat Barbie trades in being a lawyer for being a masseuse. We love it! And Black Barbie has gone from the stressful job of president to the only slightly less stressful job of a waitress. That sort of thing. This is so much better than being president! Meanwhile, the presumably previously homeless Kens... Where do the Kens stay? I don't know. ...have occupied the Barbies' dream houses and filled them with horse decorations and mini fridges full of empty beer bottles. <laughs> no, Ken, this is my dream house. It is my dream house! It's mine! And also, somehow, apparently all the previous positions of power and influence are now held by Kens instead of the Barbies. Basically, Barbie Land has become the inverse of our present-day neoliberal girl boss feminist real world. Ah! It's pink pink! <laughs> It's still fundamentally exactly the same as it was before, but with a new superficial coat of paint. Metaphorically speaking, of course. The Kens keep just about everything pink. <laughs> Beautiful. I know. Of course, this is all meant to be depressing and discouraging for White Barbie and the rest of us to see. Of course, no one bothers to ask how the whole Kens now control the government and society thing actually happened. Like, were they voted in? Was there a coup? Or... But before anyone can ask that, the situation becomes even more dire when it's announced that the Kens will be voting in 48 hours to change the Constitution. And now you're making it permanent with a special election to change the Constitution. Presumably to the Constitution. <laughs> That's right. In just 48 hours, all the Kens will head to the polls and vote to change the Constitution to a government for the Kens, of the Kens, and by the Kens! Worry not, though. Everything is resolved. You see, Gloria and Sasha, with the assistance of Dyke Barbie and a bunch of non-Barbie social rejects, we'll get to them, help White Barbie figure out how to reprogram all the brainwashed dolls with 2010's feminist dialectical dissonance. By giving voice to the cognitive dissonance required to be a woman under the patriarchy, you robbed it of its power. Yes. And then essentially they use their feminine wiles to get all the Kens to have a giant beach party and in doing so forget to vote on changing the constitution. You know what I think? I think we should put our frickin' constitution back. <sighs> yeah. Weren't we supposed to vote today? What? To change the Constitution. Oh, that was today, wasn't it? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's how that happens. Look, I'm not expecting an insightful, nuanced, progressive political allegory from this feature-length toy commercial, but you cannot invoke all these real-world political entities and phenomena to convey a message and expect not to be confronted with actual real-world criticism. Especially when you start making choices like... For example, repeated visual references to Mount Rushmore, together with a line comparing the Ken's reductive idea of patriarchy to the smallpox used to carry out indigenous American genocide. This is like in the 1500s with the indigenous people in smallpox. They had no defenses against it. Yeah. Okay, for real, Greta and Noah, what the actual fuck was this line? Like in a movie filled with some really weird, really bad choices, this was probably the worst. Or at least the most aggravatingly tone deaf. Or a cheeky reference to the Kens trying to build a border wall to keep foreigners out. How absurd, am I right? Or the line in the movie that probably made me the most angrily confused of all. Please may the Kens have one Supreme Court justice. Oh, I can't do that. <laughs> but maybe a lower... Bitch. You are the president. You are literally the only person who can choose and install Supreme Court justices. What the fuck are you on about? No comment! <laughs> no, seriously, no comment. Look, this tiny exchange shouldn't upset me as much as it does. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that in the past two years, the real United States Supreme Court has stripped away LGBTQ civil rights and reproductive rights, and will soon do the same to gay marriage rights as well. And maybe it also has something to do with the fact that a not insignificant part of the reason why this Supreme Court was able to do such things at all was because 10 years ago, a stubborn and decrepit girl boss refused to step down and let our black president appoint a successor who wasn't a right-wing rapist in her place. Fuck Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Though I'll admit, it's unfair to solely blame Black Barbie for not understanding how their government actually works. Cause, you know what? Might be spicy, but I'm just gonna say it. We're meant to laugh at how stupid all these Kens are, but every single one of these Barbies is just as stupid and ignorant as their Ken counterparts. You remember how I said earlier that what Ken brings to Barbie Land is not actually patriarchy? Yeah. Here's what I mean by that. Patriarchy is built into the very foundation of both the real world 
and this fictional Barbie land. How can this be? After all, we all know that the United States of America ceased to be a racist nation once we elected a black president. And if Hillary Clinton had been elected in 2016, that, of course, would have solved sexism. That's how it works, right? No, my beautiful strangers, that is not how it works. In the same way that the United States continued to be a white supremacist system, even with a black president in office, having a woman in the White House, or any governmental building for that matter, isn't how we dismantle patriarchy. Because Barbie Land is definitely supposed to be the United States, right? I mean, they have a president, a Supreme Court, a Congress, they have their own version of the Hollywood sign and Mount fucking Rushmore, and the Constitution. Oh my god, can we talk about this fucking Constitution? I think we should put our freaking Constitution back. Yes, I am fixating on this, because the narrative stakes kind of revolve around it. Because in 48 hours, Barbie Land becomes Ken Land. Tomorrow, the Kens vote to change the Constitution. So we have to get there first. I really want to know. How did these legislative decisions get made? What's up with Barbie Congress? See, to amend the U.S. Constitution, a notoriously difficult process, by the way, it has to go all the way through both houses of Congress and then be ratified by three-fourths of state legislatures. Where the fuck are the Barbie state governments? No comment! Ah! And that's just for a single amendment. To overhaul the whole thing, 27 amendments down, all the way down to we the people? Oh, sweetie. Oh, and how did the Barbie Land Constitution come into being anyway, given that women weren't able to vote until 1920? Wait. Given that white women weren't able to vote until 1920, 19 amendments in. I mean, ultimately, fuck the U.S. Constitution. The only parts of it that are actually meaningfully invoked in the present day are the first two amendments, and those weren't even a part of the original fucking text because slave-owning states wouldn't ratify it if the Constitution proper did something crazy like codify human rights. Okay. We're not even gonna broach the whole slavery in Barbie land question, because this video is long enough as it is. Going back to the Barbie girls that run the Barbie world. Did Black Barbie and the Supreme Court formally resign? Or did they just take a few vacation days to have some fun on the beach? And if they did formally resign, when did a Ken get elected president in Black Barbie's place? Or how, for that matter? Look, if you're gonna save the day and restore the status quo by voting, then maybe think about the mechanics of it for half a minute. All those in favor of letting Barbie land be Barbie land. Say I. Do you understand the damage you're doing by teaching an entire generation that voting is an effective way to enact systemic change? At the end of the day, we can laugh at the Kens being silly with their play fighting. They're just playing war. Yes, they're dumb and a complete joke. Ha 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 ha. But let's be honest, the Barbies are just as dumb and just as pathetic. You know what I think? I think we should put our freaking constitution back. They're being silly. They're play voting. They're just playing government. Say I. Ah! Really, it just comes down to this Ken. We just explained to them the immaculate, impeccable, seamless garment of logic that is patriarchy and they crumbled. And honestly, if everyone in your society can be convinced to step down and play bimbo by this dopey motherfucking horse boy. At first I thought the real world was run by men. And then there was a minute where I thought it was run by horses. Your society deserves to be dismantled. <laughs> oh, another random question regarding how the world actually works. Do these Barbies not have deeds to their dream houses? This is my dream house. It is my dream house! It's mine! No. And Barbie Land has a fucking constitution like the United States, but somehow no private property rights? I don't buy that. Obviously, Ken and the boys are illegally squatting in these dream houses. So why doesn't White Barbie call the pigs? Oh, wait, actually, where, where is Police Officer Barbie? Okay, well, it's good to know that there actually is a line of tastefulness that Mr. and Mrs. Mumblecore won't cross. Probably a good call. What bird am I thinking of? Parrot. Dolphin. I mean, no, a bird. Pelican. Oh, man. So, you may have noticed we've gotten pretty far in the video, and I haven't really paid much attention to the gender weird elements of Barbie yet, which is pretty unusual for me. And look, despite my strong negative feelings, I enjoyed several aspects of this film as a woman. The little girl in me had a delightful time. Now she's faded to an eternity of making other Barbies perfect while falling more and more into disrepair herself. But as a queer trans woman, this movie left a really bad taste in my mouth. And we all call her Weird Barbie, both behind her back and also to her face. She's so weird. If you can't tell by my exclusively referring to Hari Neff and Kate McKinnon's token characters as Tranny Barbie and Dyke Barbie, sorry for that, but that's how I felt about them. Flat. Hari Neff, who is a goddess and deserves so much better than this, was pretty much just window dressing, someone thrown in there to make the transsexuals feel like we belong. I like being a helpful decoration. And I gotta say, her most laughable moment in the film felt kind of flat for me. <gasps> flat feet! Look, 
I don't think this joke was meant maliciously, and who knows, I might just be reading too much into it, but making your token trans Barbie be the one who drops her voice an entire octave in service of a joke wherein a group of people react with revulsion and mass vomiting to an unexpected part of someone's body? That's... a choice. Also, regarding transgenderism in Barbie land, what's with Ken made? Hi, Barbie! Oh! Okay. Hi, Ken. I love John Cena, and I love that this character exists at all. I was giddy when he showed up. But I'm not entirely sure what the joke is here. Why does White Barbie react with surprise? Was Ken made not like this before she left? Is it the hair? Is it the tail? Is it the John Cena? Anyway, I, I, I don't want to assume this is a transphobic joke, but like, I, I need someone to explain to me why this is supposed to be funny. Oh, looks like this beach was a little too much beach for you, Ken. If I wasn't severely injured, I would beat you off right now, Ken. I'll beat you off with you any day, Ken. Hold my ice cream, Ken. And now, at last, we come to the dystopia of it all. Hi, Barbie! Good morning, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Ken! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Ken! Hi, Ken! Hi, Ken! Hi, Ken! Hi, Ken! Hi, Barbie! 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 Hi, Ken! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! Hi, Barbie! I know, it's the very premise of the film and the Barbie brand itself, and it's silly to question it. All of these women are Barbie, and Barbie is all of these women. Well, it would be silly if the film itself didn't constantly call attention to how strange it all is. Hi, Barbie! Oh, hi, Alan. There are no multiples of Alan. He's just Alan. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused about that. It was truly baffling when they returned Barbie Land to the status quo at the end, and absolutely no one thinks to question the most bizarre thing about this world, that 99% of its population has one of only two names. No Barbie or Ken should be living in the shadows. Or Alan. Yes, it's stupid, but what can I say? I'm non-binary and the Barbie Ken binary deeply vexes me. And what makes it particularly vexing is that at its core, this story is about personal identity. You're not your girlfriend. You're not your house. You're not your mink. Beach. Nope, you're not even beach. Maybe all the things that you thought made you you aren't really you. Oh, really, white Barbie? Really? Tell me, strip any Ken or Barbie from all the things that Mattel says makes them them, and what are you left with? Like, I joke by calling President Barbie Black Barbie, but for real, once she's no longer president, who the fuck is she? Her only distinct defining quality is that she's played by Issa Rae. Same with Beach Ken. Take away Beach, and the only thing that gives him any sort of identity distinguishing him from an entire population of Kens is the fact that he looks uncannily like Ryan Gosling. What about Dyke Barbie? Hey. <laughs> Weird Barbie. I just want to say, I'm sorry we called you Weird Barbie behind your back and also to your face. So, what's this Barbie's deal now? Would you like a job in my cabinet? May I please have sanitation? It's yours. Honestly, was this a little exchange just to make a haha, -ha, okay, Weird Barbie's gonna be a garbage lady joke? Because in the US President's Cabinet, there are 15 executive departments. Agriculture, Commerce, Defense, Education, Energy, Health and Human Services, Homeland Security, Housing and Urban Development, Interior, Labor, State, Transportation, Treasury, Veterans Affairs, and the Attorney General. No sanitation. I'm just saying. And then, the most interesting part of the entire film in terms of identity, I'm talking, of course, about Alan. Who are you? I'm Alan. Oh, you are Alan, that's great. I shit you not. If this film was about Alan and his perspective, it would have been 1,000 times more interesting. I mean, it wouldn't really be a Barbie movie then, but that's the thing. Not one person would care if Alan was in the real world. In fact, it's happened before. All of NSYNC, Alan, yes, even him. Firstly, Alan is queer. And I don't just mean he's homosexual, it doesn't make a lot of sense for beings who don't experience sexuality. Although apparently he was originally going to be played by the super heterosexual Broadway boy Jonathan Groff, so make of that what you will. No, what I mean is that in a world that is 99% Barbies and Kens, he's the only Alan. There are no multiples of Alan, he's just Alan. Yeah, I'm, I'm confused about that. But even though I don't see how they could have focused on this character without radically altering the whole film, it's still weird how blatantly they just kinda ignore him as an anomaly. Humans, we're fine. And Alan. Mm. Come into my weird house. No Barbie or Ken should be living in the shadows. Or Alan. Hey. Hey. 
his very existence should be enough to send all of Barbie Land's residents into an existential crisis. But no, he's just Alan. Hi, Barbie. Oh, hi, Alan. Now, his existence is justified in terms of the real-world Barbie product. There was an Alan doll introduced in 1964 as Ken's buddy. Both things Michael Sarah says to the border wall's construction workers were part of Alan's advertising. I'm Alan. I'm, uh, I'm Ken's buddy. Yeah, all his clothes fit me. <laughs> and in all fairness, he's not the only one in Barbie land with a unique name and identity. Hi, Barbie. <laughs> Hi, Skipper. There's Skipper, introduced in 1964 as Barbie's little sister. As mentioned in the opening, Barbie is an adult, but back in the product's early days, there was apparently a perceived demand for a younger Barbie, and thus... Skipper. Growing up Skipper? Fun fact, actually, the Skipper with the boobs was supposed to be a teenager, and her breasts were made to be growable to illustrate her adolescent development. It was controversial, as you might imagine. May I? Okay. Watch this. Ah! Her boobs grow. Why would they do that? Like, I don't know. It's dumb in hindsight, but I think it's actually kind of an interesting concept for a doll, and not as misogynistic as the film tries to imply it is. Ah! Her boobs grow. Why would they do that? And then, there's Midge. Hi, Barbie! And Midge! Midge was Barbie's pregnant friend. Created in 1963 and marketed as Barbie's best friend. And in my opinion, the way the film glosses over and ignores Midge is even more frustrating than how it dismisses Alan. Hey, Midge! Well, let's not show Midge, actually. She was discontinued by Mattel because a pregnant doll is just too weird. That's a way of putting it. In actuality, Midge's pregnancy was the subject of controversy because of the perception that she was too young to have children, that she was an unwed single mother, and that she was encouraging teen pregnancy. You know, standard American moral panic shit. So what they did in the Barbie canon was, well, can you guess? Midge is Barbie's best friend, Alan is Ken's best friend, and Comphead is a hell of a drug, so of course they made the characters married. Which makes the implication that Midge's baby is Alan's, which in the context of the Barbie movie doesn't really track. Come on, look at this guy. He's not knocking anyone up. Great cheer, Kins. Lack of genitals, notwithstanding. Also, given how they're set up when they're briefly introduced, it seems like Skipper and Midge might live together. So, my headcanon is that they're a lesbian couple, and fuck it, Skipper can be trans and the baby could be hers. Ah, her boobs grow. Why would they do that? See? There you go. Barbie's best friend and her trans sister being a gay couple perpetually stuck in a state of expecting? Bam. More interesting story than what we actually got. And finally, this brings me to the Barbie movie's ultimate failure. The nature of play and the matter of names. If that was really a mirror, you see a perfect smile. I will confess, I did not play with Barbie dolls growing up. Like many trans women, I wasn't allowed to have a normal girl childhood. My pre-existing fondness for Barbie exclusively came from watching the movies. My favorites were Swan Lake and The Princess and the Pauper, because I'm a lesbian. Because my sister was a bitch and would let me play with her Barbie dolls. Not that she's ever gonna watch this, but I'm totally kidding. My sister was perfectly fine when we were growing up. She only became a bitch as an adult. So I've not played with Barbie dolls myself, and I don't have children. So I'm in no way familiar with how kids actually play with them. But my favorite behind the scenes story of the Barbie movie comes from Ryan Gosling and what happened when he told his daughters that he would be playing Ken. Apparently they were confused and asked, why Ken? What was interesting to me is that my kids don't just brush their hair and dress them up. None of them have names that are Barbie. They don't even call him Ken. One of them is named Daryl and Daryl works at a grocery store. Meanwhile, they had named Barbie Gym Class. Gym Class met Daryl at the grocery store, but Gym Class, she's focusing on herself right now. They all have complicated backstories, lives, relationships, hopes, dreams. It's incredible how intricate the world is that they've created. In addition to this being so fucking adorable, this illustrates something very important and wholly overlooked by Mattel's Barbie movie. Barbie the product is only the starting point of her as a character. I mean this 100% seriously. Children are better storytellers than corporate marketing teams are. We sell dreams and imagination and sparkle. Even saying Mattel meets the kids who play with their dolls halfway gives them too much credit. The value of Barbie dolls to children does not come from Mattel. It comes from themselves, from the organic and ever-changing nature of their imaginations, from the myriad unique names and stories kids give these otherwise unremarkable homogenous molds of plastic. You use your imagination. Hey, I was still singing. That's really what irks me about the fact that virtually everyone in Barbie land has only one of two possible names and by extension identities. Despite what the text explicitly says, this imaginary world is very clearly not the result of children's imaginations. Is Barbie Land like an alternate reality or is it like a place where uh, your imagination- Yes. yes. Great. 
<laughs> it's the byproduct of a history and lore entirely manufactured by Mattel's marketing. Sure, there can be a black Barbie, a trans Barbie, a weird Barbie, but ultimately, they all must remain Barbies. Because at the end of the day, Barbie is a brand. And despite the best intentions of the admittedly skilled creatives who made this film and did their best to make a story that speaks to people on a personal, emotional level, they are not able to color outside the lines that the Mattel Corporation has already drawn. At the end of the day, no Barbie or Ken can actually be their own person with their own distinct identity because Barbie and Ken are products ultimately meant to be marketed and sold. And this brings me to the ending, where I believe the filmmakers could have done something much more radical than what they did. I don't really feel like Barbie anymore. I want to be part of the people that make meaning, not the thing that's made. I want to do reimagining. I don't want to be the idea. This is fascinating, and a good move for this story about identity and wanting to define oneself outside of what's socially imposed on us by capitalism. But then, immediately after this exchange, they completely squash and squander this opportunity. Do you give me permission to become human? You don't need my permission. Ruth Handler says she doesn't need to give Barbie permission to become human, that it's something she can just decide for herself. But then... So being human's not something I need to ask for? I can't in good conscience let you take this leap without you knowing what it means. So I guess Barbie kind of does need her permission. Take my hand. And it's this bitch who bestows humanity on her, signified by her taking her first breath as a human. Now feel. To flow. Like Adam's creator breathed life into his molded clay body, Barbie's creator breathes life into her molded plastic body. Now, if that had been the end, that would have been cool. You know, it's poetic and thematically resonant. Barbie the doll's creator sets her free by making her flesh and blood human. I can take that, I suppose. But the last scene just fucked all of that up. Name? Oh, I'm um, Handler, comma, Barbara. And what are you here for today, Barbara? I'm here to see my gynecologist. Now, I might be a bit biased, because I'm sure I would have found the gynecologist joke more amusing if I was a cis woman, but I'm trans. I became a woman by choice, and not by God giving me a vagina. But whatever. There are things I don't expect from annoyingly cishet women like Greta Gerwig. And again, I'm sure she wasn't trying to maliciously erase trans femininity with this haha, now she's a real woman because she has a pussy bit. I can overlook that. But what really frustrated me was this. Name? Oh, um, Handler, comma, Barbara. It's the matter of her name. You remember four years back, how the worst Star Wars movie ended? Who are you? I'm Ray. Ray who? When J.J. Abrams entirely reversed and undid the beautiful and profound point of creating identity from oneself instead of legacy. Ray Skywalker. That's how it felt when Barbie assumes the name of her creator, Handler. She says she doesn't want to be Barbie anymore. She wants to define herself and be her own person. So, of course that means she not only keeps the name Barbie, but chooses to brand herself with the name and legacy of her creator, Ruth Handler, and her namesake, Ruth's daughter Barbara. Handler, comma, Barbara. Yeah, my hot take is this movie shouldn't have ended with Barbie going to the gyno. It should have ended with her changing her name by rejecting the legacy of those who created and defined her to become her own person. You know, the way that the real human beings who play with Barbie dolls do. Even if it's something as weird and silly as gym class, it's an exercise of her imagination and agency. And it wouldn't have even had to be, like, out there random. Because guess what? The thing that makes the Barbara Handler thing even more frustrating is that Barbie does actually have her own unique name. Barbie's full name is Barbara Millicent Roberts, and it has been since she was invented. And she's not the only one with her own unique name. Ken's full name is Kenneth Sean Carson. Alan is Alan Sherwood. His beard Midge is Margaret Hadley Sherwood. Now, personally, I would have ended it with her getting an ID or a social security card with the name Barbara Millicent Roberts, and she'd choose to go by Millie for short. That'd be cute. Nothing too radical or out there, but it beats Barbara fucking Handler. Or get really silly with it and have her change her name to Margot Robbie, implying that Margot Robbie, the actress's origin story, is that she's an actual Barbie doll brought to life. But changing her name would actually make the point of her asserting her humanity and agency, and ultimately rejecting the Barbie name, and more importantly, the Barbie brand. 
And if getting a name change doesn't sound as hashtag relatable to women as seeing a gynecologist, well, that just goes to show how much this film could have benefited from the trans feminine perspective. And honestly, changing one's name really should be a more standard practice in our society, not just for trans people. Cis people, you know you don't have to be stuck with the name your parents gave you. It's actually fairly easy to change it. You should try it sometime. I'm, I'm serious. Bye, Barbie. Good luck in reality. In conclusion, no. The Barbie movie is not leftist or radical or even that progressive, if I'm being honest. It's a fun time, though, and all the creatives involved had a blast making it, which really shows it was made with love, and I appreciate that. So if you're expecting a landmark feminist masterpiece, don't even bother with Barbie. But if you do check it out, again, do not pay for it. It definitely isn't worth your hard-earned money, and it's already gotten over a billion dollars. Instead, considering maybe visiting my Patreon and joining the Strange Butterfly House for as little as a dollar. These beautiful butterflies fluttering up the screen help keep me from starving and being homeless. And equally importantly, they allow me to keep making videos like this. Here's my Kofi Cash App and Venmo if you'd rather just give a one-time donation. I really appreciate anything anyone's able to spare. Anyways, this video has gone on much longer than I wanted, and I was overall more negative than I generally like to be, but whatever. Hope y'all have had a strange night. I'll see you next time.